usually we start with a demonstration. Today, tonight we're going to start with a video uh, of a piece called Black Angels, which was very inspirational for the beginning of the formation of the Kronos Quartet. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming. It's good to be here. Um, so that was Black Angels, a, sec a section of that. Um, and uh, that was a really, as David introduced it, um, huge part of uh, inspiration for the beginnings of Cronus. But, um, and that was back in like 1970, like that piece came out. Was, the was, piece was written in 1970, and I first heard it in 1973, in August of 73. All right. Well, before we get into that moment, um, let's go back to the very beginnings of uh, your life and how how all this how this whole thing uh, how you got to that point and um, what was what was your uh, childhood like musically like what uh, what wh where was the first spark? Well, I would not be here talking to you this evening if it was not for the Lawrence Welk show <laughs> and. In the late 1950s, or middle 1950s probably, there was a wonderful violinist. And every week, Dick Kessner and his Stradivarius, uh, he played a solo. And I grew up watching that, listening to him. And seeing the way he played, hearing what he sounded like and, and what the instrument could sound like was very important for me. And at age nine, I started um, uh, in the public schools in Seattle. And f for me, um, you know, being, being able to be a musician at elementary school was a really important part of my life. And I had a wonderful teacher, Mrs. Cosby. And... Um, she was fantastic. And, and another 
important part for me of my musical education um, definitely had to do with her um, peanut butter cookies. <laughs> and she always said, if I had a good lesson, I'd get a peanut butter cookie. Well, it, it seemed like I always got a peanut butter cookie, even if the, you know, I hadn't practiced. But um, So th that kind of encouragement uh, was really important. And my parents um, are still very supportive. And, um, you know, to do something like music, it takes a lot of... Uh, a lot of help, a lot of support, and, and I feel in those days, at least in the, in the public schools in Seattle, I was able to get that. And then uh, a little bit later, then there was the Seattle Youth Symphony. And by the time I was 12, I had become a member of the Columbia Record Club. Some of you may, may remember that. Uh, if you sent in a penny, you got five or six free LPs. And um, one of the LPs I chose, probably because I'd been reading a biography of Beethoven, was uh, his string quartet, Opus 127. And when I heard that for the first time, it totally changed my life. And um, I haven't heard this recording uh, except in the last several days. I hadn't heard it for about 35 years. But I'm going to play it right now. Let's see. I'll be sure it's loud enough. <laughs> So when I heard that, I played those opening measures over until the, the threads were bare on that LP. And additionally, I went down to the Seattle Public Library and checked the music out, the library, and called up three friends from the Youth Symphony. And we got together and we started playing those chords, those opening chords. So you found the music and were able to. Yeah. And we've got a picture up here of uh, is this from that from that era? You've got a, yeah, uh, you've got a Beethoven yeah, I, shirt on. I've got my Beethoven shirt on. Yeah. Uh, that was about about that time, probably. Do you know where was this? Uh, that was at the Fort Flagler uh, music summer music camp. Now was that the ocean behind? Yeah. There? Yeah. It's uh, you know during the First World War it was an army base, and. Uh, so we lived in the barracks, and uh, this, this is a great big um, uh, field, and we were probably playing, I don't know what we were playing at that point, but it uh, looks published, so it must have been European, it must have been old music. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, w what happened to me at age 12 was the Budapest Quartet recording of Opus 127, that sound just entered my life. And it's been there ever since. And, you know, last week when I heard this after so many years not hearing, I recognized the, the tone instantly. It, it just, it's, uh, it magnetized me. Mm. And, you know, having a piece of music that you can sit down with your friends and play and it sounds a little bit like the record you just heard. It, it's really thrilling. And, it, it, you know, it, I got a little chill on my back at that age. And that little chill on my back has lasted me the rest of my life uh, because um, it was fun and it was inspiring. And um, the measures after what I just played for you are really hard to play. And we didn't get very far in that first rehearsal, but we got far enough that we felt good. And it, it, it kind of launched me on uh, the idea that I might be able to make, or be a part of making a sound mm. that was meaningful to, to myself, mm. hopefully others. And so were you, you were taking kind of private lessons yes. in the school and, um, and, re and performing in the school orchestra and in this uh, youth symphony? Yes. And, and then we'd split up into, you know, uh, 
well, I became a quartet addict at age 12, and that's basically all I wanted to do from then on, really. And these were with other kids? Yeah. Through mm -hmm. that time? Yeah. And then you continued your studies. Now, were you listening to, I mean, this was in the 60s that you were uh, that age. Were you listening to the, all the other music that was happening in the world? Um, and well, uh, you know, and, and it, it was about 1965, and my family moved to the center uh, near the University of Washington, and I went to Roosevelt High School. And there was a wonderful high school teacher there named Ronald Taylor. And every kid in the universe needs a Ronald Taylor in their life. He's the kind of music teacher that would, he would get you out of PE class. He'd say, David has a bloody nose, he can't go, or, you know. Anyway, so he, he did anything that I needed to play more music. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was a music store, a, a record store, about two blocks from the high school. And in those days, you could go into the little booths and open up the LPs and listen. And that's where I first heard uh, Stravinsky and Bartok and uh, Thelonious Monk and um, you name it. I, I, I listened to a lot of stuff in, in Standard Records and Hi-Fi in Seattle, Washington. Now, did you ever uh, consider, did, were you listening to other things like jazz and other styles, did you ever consider taking your instrument into those other genres and outside of the classical idiom, or were you always pretty focused on the well, classical? you know, I, th I think that um, another thing that uh, they had at, at Roosevelt High School was, was a really wonderful collection of 78 recordings. So I remember hearing music from Africa, from Ghana, and from... Um, I'm thinking uh, South Africa, and it, I, I can't remember all the different places. But I remember at a certain point just thinking, wow, I'd love my violin to sound like some of the things I was hearing on these recordings. Mm -hmm. And then I also remember um, at a certain point realizing that all of the music that I'd played for string quartet was written by four guys that lived in the same city. So there was Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, and Schubert. They all lived in Vienna, Austria, you know? And that was really a, a, a stark realization, because when you look at the globe, that's, that, that's such a small little point, and there's so many other places, and, and you begin to think of all the other people in the world and what they're contributing to music. And it was about at that age, about age 16, when I first met Ken Benshoff. And Ken Benshoff became my composition teacher, and I was in a quartet, and we played uh, a world premiere. That was my very first world premiere at age 16. Of his work? Yes, it was a piano quintet. Mm. And beautiful piece, beautiful piece. And, um, and the experience of going over to his home and putting this piece together, and as it was being composed, mm. so every, every week or so we'd have a rehearsal and there was a little more of the quintet, and it began to be revealed as an entire work. Mm. And then when we got to perform it, uh, going out on the stage and feeling like, this music is mine, you know, I, nobody else has ever heard this before. And, you know, we get to share it with people and, and you know, it, it's, it's new. You know, and so there was this kind of feeling of of um, uh, personal Ownership, connection, you know. you know, that was really special. And basically, I, I got hooked on that uh, that feeling and and that kind of. Um, uh, well, last night we did our 703rd world premiere last night, and I was telling the audience, uh, we must be kind of um, somehow in love with the uncertainty and the unsureness of playing things we've never done before in public. You know, it's kind of, it's a bizarre way to live in a certain way, but it's also thrilling and fun. Wow. Um, so as you continued then through, uh, through high school, um, did you, were you pretty sure that you wanted to do that professionally at that point? Or were you, uh, was it, how are you approaching that aspect of it? Yeah. Career, you know, what did what, you... Uh, I mean, what happened to me was um, my, well, I, I always had different jobs ever since I was a, quite a young kid. I mean, if it was, you know, might be picking berries or uh, 
selling newspapers or uh, uh, I used to sell earthworms at, at a, you know, a local store. And in fact, one of my violins, um, and I'm going to be playing that violin uh, um, tomorrow night, as a matter of fact. Um, one, of those, uh, one of the violins that I play, uh, I bought by selling earthworms and saving the money, you know. But, uh, so I always had jobs, and um, um, when uh, I was graduating from college, I heard about this opportunity in Alaska. And the opportunity was to be in the Alaska Centennial Orchestra. And so I auditioned, and I got the job. And so I went up to, I, I didn't even go to the graduation, actually. And this was your college graduation? No, high school. Oh, okay, high school. High school, yeah. And uh, so... But you there, did graduate. I, well, I think so. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, so there I was in, in Fairbanks, Alaska, and then there you was... You knew no one there. Did no, you know, you no. Just, you got the job opportunity. And job you... opportunity. A bunch of young people went up there, and we did showboat. You know, like two or three shows a day, and and um, then the uh, Centennial went bankrupt. Okay, and so and I was having a great time up there, and so I I thought, well, I'll just try to get on a forest fire crew. I heard you could make a lot of money doing that. So um, this is in Fairbanks. Yeah, and. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I was, uh, so I, I got on this crew, but it was in Eagle, Alaska. Do you know where that is? It's, it's over near the Canadian border. Okay. Long ways away wow. from Fairbanks. And the way we got there was by helicopter. And for anybody that knows me, they know that I'm incredibly, uh, reluctant to, to be off the ground. And somehow I ended up in the front seat in a, in a helicopter with no bubble. And it, it scared the hell out of me for hours because <laughs> I, mean, I was petrified. Because I think it took three or four hours to get there from. And uh, so anyway, then I was on this forest fire crew for a while. And, uh, and were you, when you when the orchestra went under and you were fire, fighting fires, were you still playing? Were you able to? Were you playing in any capacity? No, I, at I, all, I sent my violin back on the airplane. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> my parents picked it up at the airport. And at that point, were you imagining maybe that was what you were going to do for a living, or? You know, I don't think I was that organized at that age. <clears throat> you know, I mean, and I was interested in a lot of things. A lot of my friends went to music school, and they ended up very unhappy. Mm. They ended up not. Uh, a couple of my friends went to Juilliard, and several went to Eastman, and um, I noticed. Um, you know, as we were comparing notes the next year, I noticed that a lot of them didn't didn't even end up staying with music. And um, and I was interested in poetry and and history and anthropology and bio. I was interested in a lot of stuff. Mm. And so, uh, but mainly quartets. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you couldn't get any credit at college for playing string quartets. And so I found myself kind of in and out of college, more out than in, probably. And, uh, so did you? So you did end up going to college, or I, applying to go? I tried as hard as I could. Where did you? Where did you do that? The University of Washington. Okay, so you came back down yeah. from Alaska then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but studying music. Well, you or was know, it a little of everything? It was poetry. It was. It was a lot of okay. things. Yeah. And and then at a certain point, um, I think I. I'd kind of stopped playing violin for a while, and then my sister got married, and she asked me if I would play for her wedding. And so, what can you say? So, and then the organist didn't show up, and so I ended up playing like the same piece about five times, and I really liked it. So what was I kinda, it? It was a Handel sonata, the the D D minor sonata, I think it is. Just solo violin with a piano. Okay. I, had, I had my pianist with me. And so uh, I kind of got back into the whole whole thing, and um, and then I f I really found my teacher, and it's important to find someone that you really can connect with. I mean, I always had very fine teachers as a kid, but uh, they a lot of them were um, kind of uh, these very demanding male, aggressive Central European types. And 
I was drill sergeant. Yeah, a little bit of that, and it's, you know, there's the way you play the violin, and that's all there is to it, kind of thing. And, and when I find, finally found Vita Reynolds, I was uh, 21 years old, and at the at the time, uh, Vita was the um, first violinist of the Philadelphia Quartet, and they had left the Philadelphia Orchestra and moved to Seattle in the uh, middle 60s. And she became my violin teacher, and. Uh, remained my violin teacher for the next 35 years and um, until her death. And we used to have the most amazing lessons because, you know, it, she taught the violin, um, she taught the person. She didn't teach like, you know, she, she taught your, 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 your body and your, your imagination. And, and so she was a wonderful person for me to, to have. And uh, I remember uh, the very last lesson I ever had with her. And it was shortly before we recorded the lyric suite of Albon Berg. And there's one note in, in that piece. I mean, there's a lot of great notes in that piece, but there's one that I, I wanted to sound. I could hear it inside of myself, but I couldn't get it out. And, and she'd always say, what are we going to work on today? So, and so I said, Vita, there's this note. Can you help me on this note? We spent six hours on this one note. And I wish I had it. I, I could play that note for you. I, I don't have it right here. But any, anyway, it's, uh, it, I think it's a little better on the record than it was before the lesson. <laughs> so anyway, she was a fantastic person, a wonderful mm. force. Well, and then <clears throat> I think about, it's around that time that you um, heard the Black Angels, right? 1973. Yeah. I'd, I'd, see, what happened to me is, um, I mean, you have to remember that there was a war going on when I was in high school and, and after. And there were incredibly disturbing images in not only the newspapers, but on television. And, and it, it, the society was in... You know, great ferment at that point. Seattle was kind of a center of uh, uh, a, a certain kind of rebellion against the war and many things, really. Um, and of course, Jimi Hendrix came from Seattle, and uh, I ran into his music, certainly on the radio, and uh, uh, there, there was this kind of sense of um, questioning, and and then there was for me there was the you know the experience with the draft board, and uh, before that I had decided I was not going to be um, a member of the armed services and fight in that war, and so what I had done is um, signed a contract with the Victoria Symphony, so I played in the Victoria Symphony for a year in Canada, yeah, and. Uh, so my, by that point, I was married, and my wife and I went there uh, for a year. And, and then came, since I hadn't been drafted, they wouldn't have wanted me anyway, but <laughs> um, I proved it to them. You kept skipping fire. Yeah. Uh, PE, right. Right. Yeah, right. And anyway, so we came back in uh, summer of 73, and one night on the radio... Um, there was Black Angels, and it was performed by the New York String Quartet, this recording that had just come out. And at first, I didn't even recognize it as string quartet music. There was shouting. There were amazing different instruments. It was, it was electric. It was, there was quotes from, from Schubert, and there was um, various languages. And it was so many things all at once. And for me, um, basically, I had to play that piece. I, did, I, I didn't have any choice. It was kind of like the Beethoven. And it was literally electric. I mean, it was literally the, electric. The, 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 it's all written yeah. for electric instruments. Yeah. Um, did, had you played electric violin no, at that I, point? No, at that point, I'd never played an electric in instrument. And so for me, the, the, uh, I, I kind of got reconnected to the. Um, the Schubert end of things 
and then got connected to the Hendrix end of things in this one piece. Plus, uh, Black Angels was written, as it says in the score, it was written in, in time of war. And for me, it will always be the um, string quartet that, that really, uh, well, as George Crumb said, said to me once, he said, there were strange things in the air. And Black Angels, to me, perfectly um, depicts those strange things that were in the air. Well, and he really wrote it as a as a protest piece, right? I mean, it was about his. He, he was a teacher, and his mm -hmm. students were all being yeah. drafted. And I mean, th there's there's some question uh, when you talk to to him about it. He, he he's very um, uh, careful about what he says about that piece, and uh, but. You know, we've worked with many, many composers since then, and a lot of composers are reluctant to circumscribe their work with, with you know, too many facts and figures, and, and, and they want to leave the imaginations of the listeners open, mm -hmm. I think. So I'm not sure that Crumb himself would say, this is my anti-Vietnam War string quartet. Mm -hmm. um, I might say that, but I'm not sure he would. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, do we have we have uh, we have it on the iPod? I think. So yeah, we can let's play the, uh, uh, the first let's moment. Let's be sure it's loud. So what was the section that we got to see on the? Uh, that on was the video de double music, and that's. Uh, yeah, that was double music. And that's from Black Angels, but it's it is the, it's, it's like the middle it's, movement it's or something. It's the second part. So, it's okay. in, in the. All right, so this is the be the very beginning of it. Right? Yeah. Should say that that's a, that's the Cronus uh, recording of that. Yes, it is. When did you uh, when did you guys record that? That was recorded um, in 1989. Yeah. Okay. And what are some of the other? I mean, what, what are what are we hearing there? Um, what, instrument like in terms of the instrumentation in this. Well, I'm the only one in the quartet that could do the tongue click. So I did all the tongue clicks, and all of us are doing the various. Uh, verbal things. Uh, we're using the stick of the bow um, 
so you, you get that ver that kind of uns uncertain sound and very textured kind of sound and the the opening is is loud with lots of reverb and we're playing right on the bridge it's called ponticello which means bridge in italian and uh and so you get a very um lots of high frequencies it's very very um it's a little bit like uh the chalkboard you know that <laughs> kind of sound <laughs> yeah. um so uh, but that piece, hearing that piece, what, was it? Was it what radio station was it that was playing this piece? You know, in, uh, Seattle. <laughs> I, I wish I could remember that. It, it, I don't remember the mm -hmm. name of the station. Many years later, um, the 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 wife of the DJ who played it that night came to one of our concerts. He he couldn't be there, but she came, and and but I I don't remember actually. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, it was it was kind of an alternative station and. It was just one of those moments, musical moments that, that um, basically I'll never uh, recover from. It, it just totally changed my whole concept of what music could be. And it really gave you the impetus to start a group. Well, right? the next, so. next month, Kronos uh, started, it was about the 1st of September, 1973. So what, what went on in your mind to, to decide it's I, that you wanted to do that, that you actually wanted to start a group and, and lead a group, um, lead a quartet that was... Well, I mean, for me, music works in this way. It, it's you, you hear something or you meet someone or you imagine something that it, it, you just have to be, you have to realize, you have to be a part of it. You, have, you, you want to work with that person, however... That might be. In this case, uh, I don't think my life would have been complete if I wasn't able to play it. In fact, I know it wouldn't. I, I mean, it, all of a sudden there was this. When the piece was over, there was this big void. Like, where had it gone? I, you know, I want it back. I want. I want to do this. I want to know how to make these sounds and create this experience. And. Um, so, you know, I think I kind of relied on all the earlier experiences I had had uh, forming groups and playing with my friends and, and um, working with composers. And at that same time, I asked Ken Benshoff to be the first composer to write a new piece for us. And he wrote a piece called Traveling Music. In fact, he started it before we had our first rehearsal. And uh, later, in the spring of 1974, we gave our very first world premiere. And I'll just play a little bit of it for you right now.
so in working with that and on that first piece, did you get to work with Ken closely as, uh, I mean, was it a similar process where you were going in and as he was working on it and trying things out and that kind of working closely with the composer? Very closely. <laughs> he uh, was a wonderful friend and uh, as a matter of fact, the night before the world premiere, I was copying out the parts with him. We stayed up all night and uh, yeah, it was, uh, we were right down to the wire and he made in a lot of changes in, in the years after that too, mm -hmm. so that the piece took on many, many different kind of colorings and qualities as time went on. And did you get to be, were you able to be kind of inside with him understanding where he was coming from in terms of what it was about for him? Or yes, what he was... d definitely, yeah. And uh, <coughs> he was my composition teacher in high school, yeah. and, and not that I was really a composer, I mean basically I'd I'd go over to his house or we'd meet in a cafe or something and we'd just start talking about music and every once in a while I'd have, have a few measures of something I'd tried to write but it, it was more just to talk about life and music with him and, and so he was a, a really important mentor for yeah. me and he, he's the one that introduced me to um, Thelonious Monk and we used to listen to a lot of things together and I remember him talking about the way Monk used um, time and, and uh, it was just fascinating. And, and, and then, we, you know, we might listen to Scarlatti after that or, um, you know. So there was a, a wide range of music and, um, th that I got familiar with, with Ken Benshaw. Right. Um, and so you have the, you formed this group um, mm -hmm. and you, you, you formed it with friends that you had in the, in the Seattle area yes. at the time? Yes. And, uh, and you guys were started putting on your own concerts and just we did we DIY had, that first <clears throat> first year uh, we had a series at the uh, University Unitarian Church and that's where Kronos first played Black Angels mm -hmm. we gave the West Coast premiere on a Sunday afternoon and in, in I think it was April of 74 and, and did um, you get to meet Crum at that time? I mean, no, through that process at all? Or? No, I, I didn't meet Crum until a few years later, in in Buffalo, New York. And uh, for those of you that have met George Crum, uh, he, you know, I, I met him at a at a party after a concert we'd given, and, and uh, he was kind of off by himself in the corner, and and I, he, he was so shy and retiring, it, you know, it, it just. Uh, I almost didn't meet him <laughs> because he was kind of off by himself. But um, what a wonderful person he is! Mm. Uh, so, as the quartet was forming, did you have an, a when did how did you start to form your uh, a sense of where you really wanted to take this group um, as it was forming? I mean, um, like repertoire and in terms of well, I'm still doing that even tonight. Yeah. Uh, you know, to me, uh, being a musician is trial and error. It's keeping your ears open 24 hours a day. It's um, allowing yourself to get magnetized if you can and accepting it when it happens. Mm. And um, But in, in the early days, um, you know, trying to survive, you know, in, in, in our uh, American society, by playing unknown music is, you know, it's, there's, there's a few, few uh, hurdles there. And were you trying to make a living at it right then? I mean, oh, yeah. that, that was the, the point. The, you the, were... From the very first rehearsal, the idea was the, the quartet, this was going to be the main focus. See, what happened to me is, is when I heard Black Angels that August evening, uh, I finally decided I was going to concentrate on one thing. And that was going to be forming a group, and we were going to play that piece, and whatever that meant. I didn't know at that point what that meant, but I remember um, staying up uh, late one night with uh, my wife and I. Got out a, a big piece of butcher paper and a bottle of wine, and. Um, our Greek and Roman mythological dictionary because we needed a name for this group. And uh, so we, we started the A, we went all the way through the, the dictionary that night and uh, wrote out all the names that either of us liked. And, and why Greek and Roman? Why it was well, the, uh, you know, that's a good question. I mean, I had been studying uh, uh, 
Greek and Roman mythology. I, I'd actually taken a class in Latin for a while. I, I, you know, I was, I was interested. I, I am interested in a lot of things. Um, I wish life was a lot longer and, and days were infinitely longer, you know, but uh, anyway. Um, and so we uh, kind of went through the whole uh, dictionary and wrote out the names that appealed to us. And the one that appealed to my wife the most was Kronos, spelled C-H-R-O-N-O-S. And time, timeliness, chronicle, chronometer, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I'd read something in, um, I think it was when I was in high school, I think my parents subscribed to the um, Reader's Digest. Well, in the Reader's Digest, I remember reading an article about how the Kodak company got its name. And they paid a lot of money to somebody to tell them that the letter K is a much more dramatic uh, letter than a CH. And I just kind of remembered that as my wife was saying how great the word Kronos was. And I said, well, I'll go for it if we spell it with a K. And so, Reader's we, Digest. <coughs> Reader's Digest, yeah. And then about two years later, we were playing in Santa Barbara, and this uh, fellow that was on the faculty of, of um, UC Santa Barbara, who, who was in the uh, Greek myth mythological department or whatever, came up to me, oh, do you know what Kronos means? And I said, sure, yeah, time, time. He said, no, he's, he's the father of the gods, the one that killed all of his children except for Zeus and uh, anyway there's there's a big history that I I didn't go to class that day I guess uh-oh uh-oh <laughs> wow um, so as you uh, as Cronus was starting to play out more and more um, did you start to um, back then were you how are you deciding what to play and what uh, were you trying actively seeking commissions at that point and commissioning people or were you well Kronos has been a non-profit organization since very the first year hmm. and that has allowed us to be able to find commissioning money and to partner with various organizations and festivals and hmm. people to uh, create the new works that we've been a part of. Mm. Um, and so that's been a really important part of, of the group is, is the fact that we um, uh, can actually uh, establish a, a repertoire. And I, I think that, you know, in the earliest days, there were so many things that I wanted to do that, that we'd never been able to do and, and, and in fact didn't exist in the medium. Um, you know, I, I, I've gone back and look at my, looked at my early lists of things that I wanted to do and from the earliest days I, I wanted there to be some African string quartet music. Well, you know, how, how could I possibly, how could that possibly, first of all, how come it hadn't been done? Secondly, how was I going to be able to do that? And it wasn't until 1984 that I met the f my, my first African composer that, that I'd ever met. And then slowly we created a body of music. Gotcha. Um, so it took eight years to make the album called Pieces of Africa. Mm. And all, basically all of our work takes a long time, mm. you know? But if you, if you decide that you're going to be a musician until you drop dead, you've got as much time as you have, you know? And, and uh, so... Uh, Make the I, most of it. Yeah, right. And, and one of the things that, that um, I find important is uh, to... I mean, I, at any point, I'm probably doing 15 or 20 projects all at the same time. So, uh, you know, I don't take six months and make something, and Kronos doesn't either. I mean, that, that's not how we work. It's we're constantly assembling, reassembling, experimenting, and pretty soon we'll find, oh, well, this idea is now going to work because we've got, we've just found this particular piece, let's say, that we've been looking for. It took, um, you know, I mentioned uh, 
we didn't record Black Angels until 1989, so 16 years after. Wow. Well, yeah. the main reason was that I, I wanted people, when we made the, that album, I wanted people, I, the album had to start with Black Angels, so it would be just shocking. And I advise listening to it at least as loud as we did tonight, maybe yeah. even louder. I mean, because when I heard it, it, it was deafening. It was, it, but Black Angels is basically a soft piece. I mean, you heard the loudest points right. just now, but it's basically a soft piece. Mm. Um, but so, so I wanted, I wanted the audience to experience that piece in its rawness and its wildness. But then, if you're going to make an album, what's going to come next? Well, it took 15 years for me to kind of remember this piece of music that I'd heard at my grandma's house when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And it was the uh, uh, Thomas Tallis 40-part motet, which is... And I got a score to that in about 1988, and I realized, God, we could, we could do this piece. We could, you know... And what I, what, what I felt was needed after Black Angels was this big expanse this like a vaulted place mm. for the audience to just be mm. for a while, and for me that became uh, so. W as soon as that idea uh, actually happened, th then I knew we could we could record Black Angels. Well, and, and it, it, in your early years, were you playing also? Were you playing uh, you know canonized uh, quartets as well, or, or were you always focusing on uh, new? New music and new commissions and in the earliest days, Kronos was. Uh, I mean, our first concert was Bartok, Webern, Hindemith, Ken Benshoff. That was the first concert we ever played in November of '73. Hmm. Um, at the same time, we were working on you know Beethoven and Haydn, and in the earliest days, we we were playing some of the European music. Uh, over the years, we've played all of Bartok's, many of the Shostakovich's, uh, um, all of Schoenberg, all of Weber, and all of Berg. And, uh, you know, we've we've done a, a lot of the, uh, like the all the Charles Ives music and things like that in the earliest days. Mm. We've done that. So, so um, I think there's there's kind of a breadth of of a sense of of what exists in, in the repertoire, or at least what did in, in the earlier days. I mean, what's happened is that the, the string quartet as an art form has just bloomed and blossomed, and it, it's just, it's an incredible moment in, in the history of the string quartet right now. Mm. It's, there's never been a time like it, actually. Well, and over the course of uh, Cronus's court, uh, career, I mean, there have been so many uh, collaborations and so many different uh, commissions and works that you've done and so many directions you've gone. And I was just, uh, because we're limited in time, we uh, we can't really go into all the detail with all of them, but I was wondering if you could maybe pick out a few kind of seminal moments um, and collaborations or things that really, really propelled Cronus uh, or opened up doors to, to kind of going in some really significant new directions. Um. Well, I think uh, when we first met Terry Riley at Mills College in 1978. And you, got, you, had, you, ended up, you had a residency yes, we did. there, and so yeah. you were there, and he was on faculty, right? That, so. That's right. He, he came in one day, and we were... Actually, we were rehearsing traveling music of Ken Denshoff, and Terry had never heard any of Ken's music since they were students together, and so all of a sudden he got connected to uh, Ken Benchoff again. Uh, and we've got a picture of him up there. Oh, well, that's uh, that's Terry and me at the uh, uh, Cape Canaveral. Uh, we were there. Uh, gee, it would have been about two thousand and two thousand, I think. And that was yeah. for the the NASA uh, commissioned you. Yeah, right? that's right. <laughs> that's right. But in in thinking of of uh, our work with Terry Riley, I think he's written somewhere around twenty pieces for Kronos. Um, and each piece requires its own sound world. And, um, you know, he, he's such a, an amazing person. Um, 
it's hard to describe him in a few words, but he, he's a joyous musical being that, that loves to share the world of music. And uh, he's introduced us to so many people that we've worked with, um, Lamont Young, John Hassel, Hamza Eldin, uh, to name a few. Pandit Pranath is his great teacher. Well, and what was that? That was that very those first interactions with him, uh, as far as how it uh, really affected the quartet and the course of the the, the quartet. Well, there, a, there was a particular moment where what, what Terry was wanting was was a sound that had no vibrato. V vibrato, for those of you that don't know, it's it's uh, what singers and bowed string players and many instrumentalists do to give the sound kind of a, a bloom and a personality and a waver. Kind of yeah, and, and it, it kind of modulates the pitch and gives an expressive quality. But what Terry wanted was a sound that didn't have that veneer of vibrato, but that was really expressive. And so we had to learn a new way of thinking of the bow. And so you, it, it's not that you do the vibrato in, in the right hand, but that, that you make it something that's very expressive, but w without shaking the pitch. Mm. And this was very difficult for us because we'd grown up learning in, in a certain way. The, the, uh, mainly you're, you're taught to th that you always vi vibrato is, is the most beautiful way to play. A bowed string instrument, you know, it's not really beautiful. It doesn't have if it doesn't have vibrato. That's what we were all taught, and so basically we had to relearn how to be expressive on our instruments. And there was a particular rehearsal where I, I just felt it happened. All of us in the in the quartet felt this moment, and this sound totally changed. Hmm. And it was because of Terry Riley and, and what he, he heard and what he was hoping we would learn to hear. And uh, when that happened, it's like our, I think our palette just it brought in like so many new colors. That it was like a whole new world of, of musical color was available to us. Hmm. Uh, and what piece was that that you were working on with him at that point? That was, it's a piece called The Wheel. And it's it's the introduction to another piece, hmm. but it's it's like a, a ballad, and and there was just he, Terry would keep keep saying, I hear it and there's absolutely no vibrato, you. and we finally got it, and uh, it's been with us ever since. So you, in in that case too, you were able to work really closely with him yes. as the composer and having rehearsals with him at, yeah. at his place, right? I mean, you were actually yeah, we went up to his ranch and spent uh, time up there, yeah. Sure. I mean, basically, um, anyone that's written for us of the 703 <laughs> pieces, we've worked with that person. They, they've been to our rehearsals. In person. In person, yeah. I think we're, yeah, we're showing some, uh, there's a, looks like that's a picture of a rehearsal with, uh, looks like with Terry. And yeah, there's Terry, yeah. That's right. Um, In fact, we're uh, rehearsing one of his most recent pieces. Um, some of you might know Walter Katundu. Well, Walter uh, designed and built these instruments that are inspired by the stro instruments, or trumpet violins, and we have a, now a set of Katundu trumpet instruments. So, how does that work? How do you? Uh, what, what do you? Do you play the? Uh, do you? Do you is there wind at all involved? No. Are you, no. Okay. No, there's there's uh, an attachment. Um, I'm the wrong person to describe this, by the way, <laughs> but there is an attachment to the to the bridge, and so the the vibration from the bridge is carried through the uh, the bell of the trumpet. Okay. And actually, if you put your ear right next to that, it's deafeningly loud. Wow! And in the early days of recording, many of the great violinists actually used stro instruments because an acoustic violin was too soft to be picked up in the early days of recording. Wow! Yeah. Uh, so, and we see these pictures of you guys uh, rehearsing. Um, you relocated to San Francisco, and that happened. That was in 1977. Okay. Yeah. So we were in Seattle from '73 to '75. Uh, 
a few days after my daughter was born in 1975, the quartet moved to upstate New York, and we were part of a wonderful program in the SUNY system mm. of uh, resident quartets for young, young groups that uh, was um, going on at that point. And uh, it was uh, Peter Marsh of the Lennox Quartet that spearheaded that. And it, Peter Marsh is an incredibly inspiring and important person in American music, I think. Mm. And you had a, I mean, the lineup, your, the Cronus lineup was changing a bit up to that point, and then, uh, but then you got the Mills residency. And well, on our on our way out to San Francisco, Hank joined. Hank is our Hank Dutt is our violist now, and has been since 1977. And a year later, John Sherba joined, and also Joan Jean Renault. And Joan was our cellist for 20 years. And that was really the lineup that, for many many years, was. Uh, it was that set lineup. And it, the, That's right. From from seventy eight till ninety eight, uh, the quartet was uh, uh, it was Joan and Hank, John and myself. And how important was that to have that continuity over those years of really? Uh, oh, I think same... it was. I think it was essential. I think, it, and um, you know, there, there was a, a wonderful feeling uh, that that we shared, and uh, many of the important. Uh, kind of foundation sort of relationships, such as with Terry Riley and with Henry Goretzky and Astro Piazzolla and John Zorn and um, Frangi Salizade and, uh, you know, many um, uh, wonderful pieces were written for, the, for that uh, uh, edition of Kronos. Yeah. Um, are there other... Uh kind of seminal moments um, or collaborations that really brought you into a, took you in new directions that really, um, I mean, several of them, right? But uh, yeah. are there some that uh, particularly come to mind? You know, there are really um, lots of, uh, there's lots to talk about. And, you know, I, I wish we had weeks. <laughs> But um, I mean, the, the thing is that when you when you start exploring the world of music, and you make the entire world of music your study, um, there's no end to where you might go. And I think that's what's happened. Um, I mean, for me, being a musician means. Um, I mean, every day I, I'm talking. I talk to composers from all over the world. It's it's what I do. I, I've been doing this for almost 38 years, every day, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And that connection to creativity from so many various points of on the musical spectrum. Is, is essential to me because what I'm looking for is, is uh, I want to assemble a body of information that adds up to something that might be useful and might teach me and hopefully maybe somebody else more about the world that we live in and might through you know this little bit of horse hair and and strings and rosin and you know, this this um, kind of grittiness that you get from that rosin on a horsehair and a string, that you might get access to the inner workings of what it means to be a human being. Mm -hmm. And for me, there's so many things it means. You know, it's it's like I. I've got more ideas for projects. I, I could live to be a thousand years old, really. Uh, I mean, um, I, I wouldn't wish that on the world. I don't think, but that it's, I'd, I'd still, I think I could. I mean, there's so many things to do, and every day there's more. You know, so what are you, you going to do? Right. Well, how have you been? Uh, how have you been seeking out your pro the projects that you're working on, or how do some of them come? Uh, well, I totally to trust my instinct. Totally. And for me, if I don't get magnetized, there's nothing I can do about it. Hmm. I don't have any... I'm defenseless. 
And, you know, music that doesn't magnetize me goes in one ear and it goes out the other ear. And that's, right. you know. But what I'm looking for is something that I can't avoid, that I can't, I can't, that, that, that pulls me, that I have to, I want to include it in my collection. I want, I want to have it as, you know, part of my life. And so, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we could play right now. Yeah. But I mean, I remember, for example, a certain moment when, when I heard Sigur Rose for the first time, that Icelandic group. And I thought, this group is a great composer. That's all there is to it. It's a great composer. And I was in Washington, D.C., and, and I, I stayed up a whole night and listened to their the album with the fetus on the cover. Yeah. I can't remember what it's called, but it's like it blew me away. And it was this sound, and it was this feeling, and it was these four young guys making this music. And it, it was like, it was the definition of quartetness, you know, in the universe. It's like they kind of took on the world, and it, it was beautiful. And I, I wanted to play that music. And so what were the steps that, I mean, eventually you did. So what, what did you end up uh, doing to kind of pursue that? And well, I, I found out how to be in touch with them. And um, Steve Prutzman from San Francisco uh, and I went to Reykjavik. And um, we went to their studio and kind of got a sense of, of them. And, and then eventually... Uh, Several members of Sigur Rós came to um, one of our uh, recording uh, sessions in Los Angeles it was shortly after September 11th, 2001. Mm -hmm. And then I went to their concert that night, and, 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 and then we eventually played in Reykjavik and played a couple of their songs, and they were in the audience. And, and uh, that's, that's so. Did did they have their music scored, or did no, you, was no, that something? Uh, was there a Steve, Steve Prutzman made made uh, our version for us, and then we've kind of worked on it. And Scott Fraser, our sound man, has created a, a whole sonic design for it. Okay, and so and that's something that comes up a lot. And we can play we can play that track actually. You uh, want to play a little of that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, w one thing I wanted to ask though was, um, you know, that when you take a piece of music like that that you've heard. Um, and then you're going to make it your, you know, you're going to make a Cronus version of it. How, what's the, how do you, um, what's that process as far as um, deciding how to take, you know, a rock band essentially and translate it to the to what you guys are doing? And um, well, for, for me, I didn't think of them as any different than myself. I mean, for me, they're they're musicians trying to make the best notes they can. Mm. And I just happened to love their notes. Mm. And so it, it was a matter of translating. Mm. Translators run the world, you know. And uh, um, I mean, when we did our version of Jimi Hendrix's Star Spangled Banner, it was because I was so pissed off at George Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld and Condoleezza Rice and all that band of crooks that I, you know, when I thought back in my own life, I thought, uh, Hendrix made the most elegant, beautiful statement about the war that our country was in at that point by playing the national anthem. And I just thought, okay, I want to take his his lead and take learn from his lesson. And our version is probably much angrier, actually. Yeah. And uh, I'll never forget, we played it at the National Gallery of Art, and they have a basement um, auditorium there. And I told uh, uh, our sound man, I said, I want it loud enough that Bush will hear it. So, we tried. <laughs> now, I think there's a video, we have a video that yeah. also goes along with the, uh, and um, I guess we can play that as well along with this. So do you want to introduce this track? Yeah, this is called, uh, are you ready? Yeah. It's called Flugel Frel Saren, or in English, The Fly Freer by Sigur Rós. version of that. <clears throat> hmm. Well, we have the uh, video for it. <laughs> Our version is more gentle. 
Well, I can see if we've got it on here, but I didn't see it earlier. Um, so uh, another piece that uh, actually we do have um, video for, and I'm very curious about, is the uh, fences, music oh, right. for four fences. Right. And that might be a good example of how, uh, how an idea magnetizes you or, mm -hmm. and, and the, how you see it through to fruition. We can watch a little of that. Sure, well. well, I was in Australia a few years ago in, in a museum and they had an exhibit of um, work of John Rose and his wife Hollis Taylor and what they had done is they'd gone out into the um, bush of Australia and they'd recorded themselves bowing rabbit fences and I got this recording and it, I went back to the hotel and started listening and it, it, it was just fantastic. I loved it. That was great. And the idea that musicians could go around the world and bow um, barbed wire fences really appealed to me as a statement, you know. And I wanted to try to find a way of bringing that statement into a concert experience. And so we. Um, Ask John Rose to, to join us and, and Larry Neff, our, our lighting designer, and um, and John together made these these instruments and um, we played a piece called Music for Four Fences and uh, we could probably look at a little bit of that video. The video, right? sure. Yeah, yeah we could, why don't we do that? <clears throat>
how does something like that get notated? And <laughs> that's that's a very good question. I mean, the, the um, thing is that John Rose started out with with a form of notation, and in rehearsal we kind of evolved our own as a variation from what he had come up with, and now it's it's a it's a system of of uh, kind of directions and, and timings, mm. and every time it'll be different. Okay. And, uh, uh, it's surprisingly, uh, when we've done music for Four Fences on tour, the, the instruments are very sensitive and they need to be tuned. And, and they're just like, like right. uh, violins and violas and cellos. I mean, uh, they're stringed instruments. And are they, do they travel as they are or do they have to be disassembled? They have and to reassembled? be disassembled. Yeah. And are, do they, where do they live? Do they live in San Francisco somewhere? Yeah, yeah. Oh. And uh, so to rehearse with those, uh, they have to be all set up. And, yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, was John with you in the stages yeah. similarly to when you were actually rehearsing it? And yeah, we, it ready? we had to rent a rehearsal studio right. and, and, you know, large one too, right. and, and get it all <laughs> put together. Yeah. And, and, you know, in, in a way, uh, a lot of the work that we, that we do is, is done that way. And um, um, so, for example, when we when we put together a Chinese home with Wu Man and Xi Jing Chen, we needed to rent a, a theater for for a couple of weeks and and actually experiment and, and lay out everything. And and Walter Katunda was making some new instruments, and we you know we had to try them out. And and, and then we were playing all sorts of uh, instruments from various regions of China. We needed to. Practice on this and, and learn learn how to do it, and, and um, so we had a lot of uh, kind of people surrounding that theatrical piece that we made. Well, and that seems to be a hallmark too of what you guys are always doing is um, new instruments and finding new instruments, and whether it's a, f a fence or uh, you know um, something that's more traditional, you know, traditional instruments that you're learning. And mm. uh, you you did bring some. Uh, yeah, that, here's uh, an instrument we're going to use tomorrow night. Um, this is an instrument. The, uh, maybe I'll put it on the table. Or just yeah, so just so it. everybody can see it. It's it's called a shrewdy box, and the, there's some modern versions that are just like little uh, electronic instruments. But but I like this one because it's it's a little like an accordion. <laughs> John, the other violinist, will tune his tambura to this note and then to this note and then to this note. And in, and in India, raga singers use this to practice with. And, and I just, I like the feel of it and, the, and the, just flavor of that sound and um, you know it's it, it, it's possible to uh, be connected to uh, so many different instruments and sounds when you're in a when you're in Kronos and and I, I just love it I, I mean for me um, uh, last night we we played a piece that we'd never used uh, this instrument before. This is called a uh, stylophone, and uh, or you can add vibrato. Remember, we talked about vibrato, right? You know, it's, it's pretty cool. And uh, anyway, um, and what piece do you use that in? Well, Nicole Lizy wrote a piece for us called. Death to Cosmisha. And three of us play this instrument, and another one plays this instrument, which is called an omnichord. And I think this might be the cheesiest sounding instrument in the universe. And for those of you that love great cheese, here it is. Now let's take that off. Uh, Sorry, how do we get that off? Okay. Uh, 
I'm not the one that plays this instrument, by the way, so uh, how do you get the rhythm off? Um, well, and you've got these two different shows this weekend. Um, we do. Uh, one tomorrow night, and you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the program for the two? Well, they're very different. Uh, yeah, you know, you know, one of the wonderful things now um, is that we have a lot to choose from. And at any point, there's probably, oh, 30 or 40 kind of ideas that are percolating and in various stages of completion. And so, um, for example, like the concert we did last night, uh, when we put the program together, we had no idea what Nicole's piece was really going to be like. I mean, I talked to her a lot, and we'd had many conversations and stuff. But until you actually get on the stage, and, and you don't really know what you have, well, what we found is we had something really cool. Okay, and in the case of tomorrow night's concert, um, we've got a whole evening that's really cool, and we've been kind of putting it together for a number of years. And this is music. Um, some of it is on an album we did several years ago called Floodplain, and uh, um, you know, it, it, there's so much music in the world that we don't get to hear in in our country. I mean, the, you know, just look at the radios and, you know, and concert music. I mean, how often do you have, you know, a Palestinian underground band at a, at a chamber music concert? It doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Well, I, I realize that. And how often do you play, you know, Iraqi music at, you know? Well, I want to do those kinds of things because I'm, I'm interested in that and, and I want to know what, what the musicians are feeling and what they're creating. And, and so for tomorrow night, basically what I was hoping to do was kind of bring a world of music together that maybe hasn't, isn't normally heard in our country, in our culture, and just see where that takes us. And there's a number of different pieces tomorrow. How many different yeah. pieces are you doing? Do we have the, uh, here's the program. You know, that's a good question. I, I should know that, shouldn't I? But, um, yeah, well, there's quite a few, I think. Music Without Borders. Yeah. Well, let's see. Well, there's about eight pieces, hmm. seven or eight pieces. And We're from playing how one many, of Terry's pieces. How many different uh, countries that will be represented? Oh, let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, eight countries. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've wanted to experiment and, and explore what it means to be a musician. What, it, what it, you know, to go to a concert, I mean, what can it be now, you know? It can be this kind of, in one way, it can be an assemblage of human creativity from many different points that are kind of coming together at, at that particular moment. Um, I find that really thrilling, you know? And um, so, I mean, um, there's music from northern Canada, there's music from Palestine and India and Serbia and Grass Valley, California, Terry's piece, and, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of stuff. And hopefully it'll add up to um, a way of thinking about the future. Mm. And the next night is uh, uh, a concert much of the music is, is quite new. I mean, there's, um, and a lot of the musicians are involved in, in, in um, forms of music that normally haven't kind of reached the uh, string quartet end of the spectrum so often. And um, some of them are very close friends and we're, are, are, we're working closely together, like with. Um, Bryce Desner, I mean, 
As a matter of fact, when I go back to the hotel tonight, I'm, I'm expecting Bryce's new piece to be at the hotel waiting for me tonight. You know, can't wait. And Bryce from the National, the Bath yes. the National. Yes. Yeah. And how did how did that collaboration come about um, of, of working with him? Well, you know, um, Bryce is is a curator, and he has a festival in Cincinnati, and he invited us there, and that's when I got to know his music was, uh, you know, as he was inviting us to play at this festival, and uh, and I got to know him, and, and it, it, you know, just talking to him, I, I, I just thought, this guy's got to write something, you know, he, he, he's really an uh, interesting person, and I, I think he has, I think he'd be able to do something really special. And, so was it, it was your idea to, uh, for him to write something, yeah. and uh, yeah. so he said, I, hey. You know, I've, I've been the talent scout for 38 years, so I, you know, I kind of get us into quite a lot of trouble. Right. Yeah. And then there's, you know, there's, I mean, hopefully the concert will add up to um, something that is more than the sum of the parts. I mean, there's, there's um, music by Damon Albarn and Laurie Anderson and Missy Mazzoli and Michael Gordon, and there, there's, there's a lot of different ways of thinking of you know, and, and I mean, music can be this kind of substance that you can work in your hands and, and shape into many different things. Mm. What's the biggest thing that uh, you feel like, um, what's the first thing that you um, try to do when you are first working with a composer um, on a new piece as far as... I mean, before they've come into the rehearsal? Or yeah, well... Well, I try to listen to what they say and what they're trying to say. I mean, wor words and music don't often, they're, they're quite dissimilar, mm -hmm. actually. So what, what a person means, if they're trying to describe what they hope to do. And I, I, I'm, uh, I, tr I try to have big ears when it comes to composers talking about their work or their lives. And um, I mean, basically, what I'm interested in doing is bringing personalities into the our world of music, mm -hmm. so that people that that I just have to know more about, like someone like Henrik Goretzky. I mean, when I first heard the Third Symphony in many many years ago now, um, I realized that this man had to write string quartets. He had never written a string quartet. He had to. And then the, the more I got to know him, the more, you know, he had to keep writing. And um, uh, what's about, what is it about the string quartet for you that is feels like when you re, when, when you when you say that when he had to do this, what was it about? What is it about the string quartet that you want to bring out of a composer? Their inner sound, the sound, uh, the, the genius of the form of the string quartet is that each person that has ever written for it sounds individual. And I don't know how, I really don't know how that happens. Is it just the economy of, and the limitations I, of the four you know, it, voices? It, it, it might be, it certainly is partly that. It might also be that it's, I guess I feel that the actual sound of two violins, a viola and a cello, that basically Haydn invented around 1750 is one of the the real amazing things that European culture has given the, the world and I, I think what it's given the world of composers whether they're from Zimbabwe or Azerbaijan or you, you name it is access to, to a, a real personal sound mm -hmm. and if you you know when Henrik Goretzky wrote there was no mistaking the voice. When Terry Riley writes, there's no mistaking the voice. Mm. When, um, you know, Nicole Lizé writes, she's, it, it's totally her voice. And I'm not exactly sure how that happens, but I, I have seen it for all of these years. And in every case, um, no two composers sound the same when they write string quartet music. 
I'd like to open it up to questions for the, from the audience if anyone has uh, a question for David. Um, we've, the ushers actually have uh, little microphones that they can pass to you, so just raise your hand and um, you can ask a question. Could you talk about a time when it got hard or you weren't sure what to do next or uh, uh, you know, being with the group has its own challenges? Can you talk about, I guess, challenges and overcoming them uh, in your art form? Uh, well, one of the biggest challenges that Kronos has ever had to surmount was the day, and I know the exact day, it was uh, September um, 19th, 1978 when two members of the group decided they could no longer be in the group and they quit and two weeks later we were supposed to start our residency at Mills College and the two quartets that had been resident quartet at Mills College previously were the Pro Arte Quartet, the great quartet from Belgium and the Budapest Quartet that you heard and the third was to be Kronos and uh, so Hank and I had to go over to Dominican College where we had a sold out concert that night and tell them, sorry, we're not going to show up. And I had to call Margaret Lyon, the chairman of the music department at Mills College, to say what had happened. And I'll never forget what Margaret said to me. There, there are angels in the world, and Margaret Lyon was one of them, and she said to me, Oh, David, don't worry. I'll know. I, I know that you will figure this out. <laughs> and so, three weeks later, Joan and John joined Kronos. And, and we, how did that happen? I mean, how, it well, happened we, because we got on the telephone, and especially Hank. I mean, I, I was decimated by that actually. When ha ha didn't Hank know them pre from school Hank or something? Hank knew Joan. Okay. Uh, neither of us knew John, and. Um, by the way, this was um, this was three days after my son was born, and so we had a, a newborn in the house, and, and it, it was a very, very tough time. And so all of a sudden, our whole livelihood was in question, and you know all that kind of thing. So how do you surmount it? Uh, you rely on your family and your friends and your and the world of music. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. I mean, there, there. Do you want to amplify on the question, or is that a close enough answer? Another other questions. Uh, David, I remember. I think in two thousand six, the movie The Fountain came yes. out, and uh, <laughs> dealing with uh, uh, mortality versus uh, eternal life and three stories going across the same storyline. Um, I also went through a very close personal death, so the movie was uh, somewhat meaningful to me. That I thought the soundtrack was quite beautiful and dramatic. The process of coming up with something like that, how does that happen for you? Well, The Fountain was a really interesting um, process because um, the, the music that we started with and the sound we started with was quite different than the sound we ended up with. And so um, Clint Mansell um, kind of opened up the, the sonic palette and we did a lot of experimenting. And we had recently recorded um, an album with of music of Frangis Ali Zadeh, and there was a certain kind of mute that I had used to sound like a rabab. And so we started experimenting in the fountain uh, recordings with various sounds like that. And, and Clint got very excited. And, and, uh, and Mogwai, the Scottish group, uh, had, had already recorded their parts. And um, uh, it, it seemed to me that in, in order to uh, balance what they'd done, we we needed to be beefed up quite a bit. So we beefed ourselves up quite a bit. And it was a lot of fun making that, that 
soundtrack. And uh, I, I think we spent about two weeks in the recording studio doing it. Uh, do you ever uh, try to combine European classical music with other types of music, like let's say Beethoven with African rhythms? Well, I, you know, I've always wondered what the world of music would have been like if someone like Beethoven would have heard um, music from various places in Africa. Um, I, I've thought it would be really cool someday to, to make a version of the Grosse Fugue um, and use some drummers from Ghana as a, a backing track or something. Uh, we might unleash something like that on the universe at some point. Uh, stay tuned, you know. <clears throat> Other questions? Somebody you've been working with um, as a collaborator um, is uh, Tanya. Uh, Tanya, yes. Who? Uh, Tanya Tagak. Yeah, uh, and you've got a, we've got a great documentary that I thought we would we could end the evening with. Um, Sounds good. Uh, and show that um, it's about seven minutes long and it's uh, it's great. Um, would you want to just talk about that? Uh, how how working with her started and and sure. what the process was a little bit. Well, you know, like I was saying, I, I try to keep my ears open. And, and at one point, um, I was on a flight from London to San Francisco, and, and I had this uh, recording. Um, it was a compilation that came, came with F Roots magazine, which is a magazine I subscribe to. And I think I was about over Greenland when I heard Tanya's track. And I must have listened to it 30 times between then and getting to San Francisco. It was the coolest thing I'd ever heard at that point. I just loved it. And I'd been a fan of Inuit throat singers since the first time I heard them back in the 70s. But I'd never heard anyone like Tanya. And um, so I resolved that I would find out where she was and someday we'd try to make music together. And um, so the documentary... And where was she? She was in uh, northern Canada, and when I first talked to her, she couldn't talk very long because she had to go to a musk ox barbecue. And uh, Arctic, she was, yeah, yeah, way up yeah, there, way up there. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, she she ha has a, a very unique approach to singing and to um, her voice. And then, in terms of the composition, how does what was the project? What did the how did the project come together? In well, terms of what was the music and yeah, I mean, it was using her. You know, you, you want to work with somebody, but right. how do you find the right music? And well, in this case, um, I kept saying, "Well, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out." And and uh, and so we got up to um, Whitehorse, I guess it was where we were, and. Um, and then I realized, well, the next morning was, you know, and they were filming a documentary about this, and I had no idea what we were going to do. And, and then I, in the middle of the night, I realized that my granddaughter's color crayons were in my bag. And I don't know how they ended up there, but they were there. And I just thought, well, of course, I'll, we'll make a piece and use colors. And so what I did is, you know, at 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm, I'm um, coloring these little pieces of paper for everybody, all, all five of us. And so we started our rehearsal at 9 o'clock in the morning. I handed out these the score, and they were essentially five or six pieces of paper that everybody got. And we each interpreted the colors. And that's how we started working together. So impro impro improvising. Yeah. Yeah. How much does impro improvisation play a role with uh, in, your, in all of your work? Well, you know... I mean, I think it's, it's, it seems like it's an unusual thing for a lot of people in the, in the classical music to be uh, able to kind of cross that line. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, first of all, I think that the word improvisation is, is sometimes abused. It, it's a word that, you know, if you improvise, you're, you're, it, it means you don't, you don't need to read the music and therefore you're freer. 
that's not necessarily true. I mean, a great performance of, of a song that everybody knows can sound like it was totally conjured up at that instant, but maybe you've lived with it your whole life to get to that moment. And so the, the improvisation involves using all of your knowledge and focusing it. And um, so this is a long way of saying that the kind of improvisation that we're doing with Tanya is, is just trying to open up our imaginations and, and you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't take the kind of skill that it would take someone like um, Louis Armstrong, who, who knew all the chord changes and stuff. There aren't chord changes in this, but there are color changes. And so we just need to be sensitive to what we're trying to do. Hmm. I don't know if that explains it very well, uh -huh. but it, you know. It's, yeah. All right. Well, uh, do you want to say? Is there anything else you want to say about this about the documentary that well, we're going the, to see? Well, the the documentary, uh, I think it'll speak for itself. It's called Nunavut. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've wanted to do a concert with. Inuit throat singing since I first heard Inuit throat singers in 1981. Throat singers sound like they have a string in their body. <laughs> and they sound like they're somehow finding a way to bow that string. It, it seems so um, earthy. <laughs> so much a part of nature. I've had the experience with one other person before musically, like connecting like this, but never with four others. So I want to hear what you guys have for your score. For we don't have anything. Don't have I was hoping that we would stay somewhat abstract okay. on this. <laughs> okay. To me, this is the dramatic structure of the piece. I had this confidence that whatever we came up with was going to be something really wonderful. But I had not the slightest idea how we were going to get there. It's like if I start with the... All of a sudden, the idea of colors just popped into my mind. So basically there's eight of these. Okay. And when we figure out the order, we can tape them together. When David came out with those colors, I felt an opening in my body or something. Because I knew it just made sense. I like the idea of the blue beside the black for some reason. Yeah, but that's yeah. what I was mm -hmm. hoping for yeah. too. Yeah. We could just start a discussion about music from colors. Where do you want to put red? Red should be closer to the end because that's when I want to freak out kind of. Okay. And I think that was the great first approach to kind of go through this piece because there wasn't notes for Tanya yeah. to get freaked out about and there wasn't nothing <laughs> for us to get freaked out about. So I mean to me what we should do is just figure out how each of these would sound. And then how to link it. Everybody just jumped in I mean, I knew there'd be total involvement with Kronos. I wasn't sure about Tanya because we've never worked together before. It was wonderful how it just kind of took on a life of its own and I could just kind of step back and let everybody just kind of paint. <laughs> They're making it up as they go along, which is completely new for them. And I am working within structure, which is completely new for me, so our balance is taking care of itself really nicely. So we're in brown, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've been rehearsing in the morning, and then we have a rehearsal tonight, but now in the afternoon, we had the opportunity to go for sort of dog sled riding, and it was just phenomenal. <laughs> Tanya is directly, musically in touch with something that is almost a ghost. And I 
to me it's, it's something that's so special and so much a part of the earth and land and the environment. This is to me is more like the crunching of, of the, the snow. snow. We started exploring some of the northern sounds and it was nice because I, I got to do one of the bird sounds. That was perfect. The tradition she comes from is basically that the Inuit singers are very close to each other when they're, they're singing. I brought about this idea of starting the piece by singing into the cello. Because the cello is so resonant anyway that, that it, it would almost seem like it was singing back to her. <laughs> It's always been my dream to interpret my home through musicians. So I guess that's what's really happening, is like, it's my dream coming true. Are you partial to the lower noises or the higher? Do you Um. <laughs> Everybody's so open to everyone else's ideas. You jump in with the deeper part when I'm not doing it. So, so, so it's like oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I got to put my two cents on what I thought the score would be. I've never been able to play an instrument. I, I, I only have my throat. So to hear some of my ideas coming through an instrument it's exhilarating. Oh, that's fun. Her language is growing and developing and, and changing all the time. Every step you take has a different sound quality to it. Uh -huh. I've always had a, a sense of her being very instinctive and, and she responds to things totally and honestly. I, I just love musical people that are like that. I keep having this feeling like we're walking towards the edge and if we had enough time together we could just jump up, like go farther and farther into it. <laughs> that sense of playfulness, of creating games and images. Yours is so big. For me it's never been as strikingly portrayed in our whole career as it has been in the last several days. I'm gonna learn how to make better music because of that. Like I can feel it opening new places when it comes to structure and how you can maintain your passion while having structure, which I didn't believe in much before. Of course, we ended with red. <laughs> Tanya has helped us with the vocabulary of what I call quote unquote a freak out. And so our very last color is going to be everybody just freaking out and ending it with a bang. The piece is. It's, it's, it's there. It's there now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited. This is cool. Should we try it? <laughs> All right, well, uh... <laughs> well, as David Hill had said, there, uh, I think there's still a few tickets left for the next couple nights. If you, can, if you don't have your tickets yet, definitely get them. Um, and David, thank you so much for taking time today to, Pleasure. to nice share day. with us and everything. Thanks all for you for coming. Thanks to Walker. Good.